Hello, everyone. Welcome to a Monday edition of Locked on Heat. I'm Wes Goldberg, and joining me today is Heat forward Haywood Highsmith. And this is an exciting episode because not only is he the newest member of the Miami Heat, but he's also got a really interesting story from playing Division II basketball and then playing overseas in Germany and in Italy before getting his chance in the NBA. The Heat are really high on Haywood Highsmith, choosing to sign him to a three-year deal over some other potential options, veterans on the buyout market. So uh, this is a great episode to have this conversation, get to know Haywood a little bit more and what Miami's plans are for him in the future. I think you're going to enjoy it. Today's episode is brought to you by Bet Bet BetOnline has you covered this season with more props, odds, and lines than ever before. It's Bet Online where the game starts. You are locked on heat. Your daily Miami heat podcast. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Hey, Wood, thanks so much for uh, joining me here. I really do appreciate you taking some time after practice today. Um, I just wanted to look ahead a little bit with you in order to kind of look backwards because you have a really interesting story. And I know that you guys, you have a game tonight against or tomorrow night against the thunder. That's first and foremost, but then looking ahead to next week, Monday night, you're going to be in Philadelphia, sort of where it all started for you. Right. So where did it, where did, what did you learn in the years that you were there? Um, And did you ultimately think that that would be where you ended up obviously before everything happened here with the heat? Uh, so over the years in Philadelphia, I learned a lot, learned um, how to be, be a pro, you know, how to be professional, um, you know, how to put the work in and stuff like that. And, um, they really accepted me with open arms. You know, the first team actually gave me a shot coming where I come from. So I'm very thankful for them. And um, I didn't really, I mean, expect, I mean, I, I mean, Philly is like kind of like my second home, you know, so I kind of, you know, expected to just be there for you know, a good amount of time. And I was with that G League team for about, you know, three years, grinding in there, grinding there with, you know, some guys that I, known for a long time. So, um, you know, Philly always be like, you know, like a second home to me, you know, I've, I've been there a lot, you know, I know the ins and outs of the city and I know a lot of people there. So, you know, it's pretty cool, you know, so, yeah. Um, I want to just kind of go back to your path to the NBA. You went to a small division two school in West Virginia. You were the D2 player of the year there. Uh, and yet you didn't really get much attention as a prospect. In fact, you didn't even get invited to the Portsmouth Invitational, which, for people listening who don't really know what that is, that's basically the draft combine before the draft combine. It, it, it's so important to the draft process, but you made your way to the Portsmouth Invitational anyway, right? Yeah. Can you tell me a little yeah. bit about that? Yeah. So, you know, come from D2 school, you know, we didn't, you know, know what the path was for me, me and my agent, you know, try NBA, try overseas, you know, and um, my agent was very persistent. You know, he thinks I'm an NBA type player. So, you know, I'm, I have comments to myself, so I thought the same thing. So, when I didn't get invited to Portsmouth, we decided to go out there to network, you know, just talk to a few people, you know, get my name out there. You know, some people, you know, knew I was, some people didn't know I was, you know, but, right. um, you know, it was, a good, it was a good opportunity to talk to people. I talked to Alan Brand up there. I talked to a few other scouts up there. So the network, and I think that really kind of helped me get out there, you know, in a ways that really helped me in, in the future when the Sixers invited me to, you know, that summer league training camp. So, yeah. So that really did almost directly lead to a training camp invite with Philly, right? And that ultimately led to um, a training camp invite with their G League program, and that's sort of how you latched on. Yeah, I had to, I got an invite to that summer league training camp, and um, they had about, you know, 15, 14 guys. They'd only taken, like, 12 right. guys, so they make some cuts. And I actually performed well. I was outperforming some of the guys that they you know, wanted to keep. And they already made promises to other people, so it was hard to keep me. So then they told me, you know, we're going to have you in our G League team as a local trial player. I never tried out. And then, you know, from there, it just, it's all working. Yeah. Now you're one of the very few players in the NBA to come from a D2 program. Do you take pride in something like that? Yeah, I mean, my whole life I've been overlooked, underrated, yeah. you know, underappreciated. You know, people look past me, people telling me I wasn't good enough. So, you know, all I did was put my head down and work and let God take care of the rest. So you know, I definitely take pride in that. I want to be, you know, a story that people can look at like, oh, that guy did it. Why can't I do it? You know, I get mm-hmm. a lot of messages on Instagram but guys saying you know, I'm, I'm their motivation how I'm helping them, you know, trying to achieve their goals. So it's, it's very inspirational, you know, to hear, hear, hear stuff like that from other people in my position. 
want to know more about that because you weren't a top recruit coming out of high school, right? And obviously we just talked about everything coming out of college and yet you kept persistent. You, where, where does that drive come from? That motivation come from to just keep kind of going for your dream of playing in the NBA? Well, I mean, I feel like with hard work, anything is possible. You know, I wasn't really the hardest worker in high school. I'm not going to lie. So maybe that was the reason why, mm. you know, I didn't get the offers I wanted or the, you know, the crews that I wanted and stuff like that. But once I got to college, you know, I really started to lock in and like just, you know, grind every day and learn how to just work hard off the court, you know, put the extra work in. You know, I think my coach in college really helped me, you know, push that out of me. You know, he was tough on me. So that's always good. Um, his, his name is Danny Sancon. One of my, I still talk to him to this day. So, um, you know, it's just all about just working hard and you just let, let, let um, the rest take care of itself. Control you can control. And, you know, nothing is, nothing is impossible, you know, as long as you just, you know, got a set path and you just work hard. And that path took you to Germany. It took you to Italy for a little bit. Uh, yeah. For people who don't really know what professional basketball is like overseas and in those areas, what can you tell people about that kind of experience uh, the, those couple of years? Yeah, I mean, I think overseas and, you know, over here in the NBA is definitely different, you know, some senses. Yeah. Uh, overseas is more, you know, about the, you know, about the team, it's about playing hard, you know, practicing hard, two a days, you know, a tough, tough type of thing over there, more over here, you know, it's more, you know, not so much soft, but, you know, it's more, you know, not as tough as it over there. And, you know, um, playing in Germany, there's no experience for me. My first time overseas, you know, I, I doubt I struggled, you know, I'm not going to lie, that was probably my worst professional career, you know, in my opinion, you know, playing in Germany for the first time. And then I did go to Italy for a little bit before coming back over here, which is you know, another story. They want me to I'll tell it, but, you know, it's a crazy story. But, yeah, I mean, I liked it. And Italy was pretty, you know, nicer than Germany, though. So it was, Italy wasn't that bad as Germany, I felt like, yeah. When you, when you say that Germany was sort of the toughest part of your career, why was that? What was it that made it so difficult? Yeah, I mean, I was away from my family, away from yeah. friends, you know, my mom, my mama's boy, my dad, you know, a lot, a lot of family. You know, me being, I played in the G League for the Blue Coats of Delaware, you know, that's right there close to where I'm from, Baltimore, Maryland. Mm -hmm. So I'm so used to my parents coming to the games, you know, my family, my friends coming to the games. I see my parents whenever I want. I can drive home, you know, we don't have practice for, you know, G League. So it was just tough trying to adjust. You know, I, I was alone a lot over there. And, you know, I had to definitely, you know, try to learn how to do some different things, keep me keep me occupied, you know. And, um, mm -hmm. yeah, just calling my, calling my family every day really helped as well. So, you know, it was a struggle, but, you know, it made me tougher. Definitely made me tougher. Well, I was going to ask you about Baltimore a little bit later on, but since you just brought it up, I, I'm curious, growing up in that area, who were the guys for you? Who were your dudes that you were watching? I would imagine there's some Carmelo Anthony love, there's some yeah. Kevin Durant love, some of the local yeah, guys. I, I grew up I grew up the biggest KD fan you probably can know. You know, I watched every game that I could for OKC when he was there. Um, Carmelo, obviously, was one of the guys, you know, Baltimore, New York, you know, he's mm -hmm. kind of from both areas. So, you know, growing up watching him, I played in Carmelo's tournament played against Carmelo's AAU team growing up. So that was pretty cool. Mm. And also a guy, you know, another guy, Will Barton, you know, played yep. with the Nuggets from Baltimore too. Also a Baltimore legend, you know, and um, all those guys really, you know, put Baltimore on the map and really, you know, helped, helped us out. Do you and Vic talk at all about that, Victor Oladipo? Uh, I don't think Vic knows I'm from Baltimore. We haven't talked about that yet. Oh, well, maybe like he'll from, listen to this and he'll know. Vic is like from like the D.C. area or something. Yeah, closer to D.C. than Baltimore. Okay, yeah, I don't think me and Vic have talked about that yet. But yeah, I mean, yeah. we'll talk about it eventually, I'm pretty sure. <laughs> so going back to the NBA stuff, uh, I, Germany, Italy, all that stuff, you end up back with the Blue Coats. You're in the G League. You're doing your thing. Uh, you're not really knowing, I would assume, what your future is at that point. But uh, you end up becoming a free agent. and you sign a hardship 10 day with the Miami heat back in December. When, when did Miami st first start kind of showing interest in you? When did you kind of have an idea that they might be interested in bringing you on? Well, I really didn't know until like probably the day that they called me, to be honest with you. Um, wow. I remember. So, you know, when, when COVID was going crazy in the NBA, a lot of people were getting called up, you know, it was during the showcase time. So, you know, my agent was telling me, Hey, you just have a couple of good games, you know, you get a call up hardship, whatever. And, you know, the Blue Coast, we actually, you know, won the tournament. You know, I had some good games and I played good. So, you know, I kind of was like looking at my phone, you know, waiting for that call. Maybe a team will call me, maybe it didn't. So Christmas, I think it's Christmas break, go to my family. You know, I'm a little not stressed out, a little worried that, you know, I didn't put in enough work, do enough things to get that call up. That I, you know, that was the goal, obviously. Been in the yeah. team, everybody wants to get called up. So uh, we come back from Christmas break and a lot of my teammates on the Blue Coast got caught up. So we was doing our practices. We didn't have a lot of a lot of guys. So our numbers was low. We was doing like one-on-one -on -one workouts, 
not doing a lot, not doing five on five with the blue coats and stuff. So get to my apartment. Agent called me like, yeah, Miami, and they need some bodies, you know, because I think they had like PJ out, UD had COVID, Kyle had COVID, I think Gabe had COVID, Duncan, there's a lot of people had yeah. COVID. And, you know, they needed me actually that day to get to San Antonio, I'm pretty sure. Yep. Yep. And I couldn't, I couldn't find a flight. So my agent was like, all right, they might not sign you now. So the next day, I think they canceled San Antonio game. And I'm like, okay, maybe I can still go. The next day, they say, okay, we do need you to fly to Houston. And then from there, I, I packed my bag so quickly. Um, I barely made it. I mean, I didn't barely make it, but it was, I was rushing to get to the airport because my flight was literally like in like an hour and 30 or two hours and I had to get there. The airport was like 30 minutes away. So it was a crazy story, <laughs> but uh, got there in time. And, you know, from there, you know. Yeah. Is, that, is that is that a situation where you're just throwing like whatever t-shirts are closest yeah, into a gym was, bag and you're just going? Yeah, literally. I, I mean, I like low key kind of packed already like the day before I was going to San Antonio. Right. So, like I, I just had to do a little bit more, but I low key was throwing like just stuff in there. But I definitely <laughs> couldn't forget the Xbox. So I had to get the Xbox. That was very what, important. But, yeah. What are the Xbox? What's the game of choice for you on Xbox? Uh, 2K, Madden, Call of Duty. I'm, I'm, gotcha. I'm a big I like Madden over 2K a lot for some reason, which is crazy. You, I'm a basketball player, but. <laughs> who you who who's your team in Madden that you're playing with? Oh, I'm I'm from Baltimore. I like playing the Ravens. Uh, that I makes sense. Like, Some you know, Lamar Jackson playing, stuff. Yeah, yeah. When I'm playing as random people, I'd be random, so it's not like you know one team is better than the other. But whatever, so. so so you sign that hardship ten day. Weird thing about the hardship ten day is that it's not a regular ten day. So you're able to sign two other regular ten days afterwards. Right. What's your communication like with the Heat at this point? Because uh, your ten day that's that second slash third however we want to kind of look at it 10 day expires they're not allowed to offer you another 10 day after that they either have to sign you or you kind of just cut cut you loose and, and just say thanks for everything and, and and you become just sort of a free agent what was your communication like uh during those last couple of days what did you think was going to happen then uh you know my agent just told me i was keep working you know on controls you control my my mm -hmm. mentality was just you know i I put in a lot of work, you know, I've did good things on the court. I've, you know, learned things here, you know, and I've, you know, put in the extra hours, you know, do stuff. So just trying to make an impression on this team, you know, as a hard worker, you know, the Miami Heat, one of the best hard working organizations in the NBA, all about culture, all about, you know, toughness and stuff like that. Yeah. So I just try to embody that. I'm always been a tough guy. And um, you know, I was excited, obviously, because, you know, I, I heard they could sign me, they couldn't, but, you know, um, I'm glad they did because, you know, it was a perfect fit for me. You know, I just, I'm all about toughness, all about, you know, being underrated. A lot of these guys on this team was undrafted like me. So it was a perfect fit. And, you know, I'm, I'm mm -hmm. very happy. I'm very happy to be here. You signed a three-year deal. Um, that's a long contract, right? And I'm sure you're, you're really excited about it. But I think it also shows a certain level of comfortability on your part, right? right. A, a confidence that this is where you could sort of make the most of your, your career for these three years, right? What is it about the organization, what you learned those 30 days and all those things that made you say, you know what, this is the place that I think I can grow and, and kind of build, uh, you know, the early part of my NBA career. Right. I think this team takes a lot of chances on, you know, guys, who, like I said earlier, undrafted, unappreciated, hardworking guys, you know, and um, perfect fit for me because I'm one of those type of guys, you know, under the radar, do anything possible, play defense. You know, I kind of, been trying to, you know, embody, not, I'm not P.J. Tucker, obviously, but I'm trying to embody him a little bit, you know, with the offense they're running and the defense and stuff. So um, three-year deal in Miami, you know, it's perfect. Actually, you know, I got a daughter. She lives in Miami, actually, too. So it's perfect fit, actually, for me, family-wise, off the court, on the court. You know, this is a great city, great team, you know, and I just, I'm all, they're all about winning. And I'm all about winning. So, you know, I'll do anything possible to win. So it's just a, just a great fit overall, for sure. How old is your daughter? Uh, she's five months. Oh, that's that's a very new daughter. Congratulations. Yeah, good morning. Thank you. Appreciate it. Congratulations. Um, you mentioned sort of trying to embody that role that P.J. Tucker plays for this team. That's a very important role for this team. Eric Spolster the other night calling you a two way player, sort of a three and D type of guy. Has that always sort of been your game? Yeah, I would say um, in college, obviously, I wasn't three and D. I was just, you know, give me the ball. I'll get a bucket, you know. Just a, a versatile guy. I'm still versatile, but I think more in this sense of the professional NBA, I definitely can see myself 3 and D, knocking down corner threes, you know, knocking down wing threes, setting screens, short roll, and making plays off the short roll like PJ does, floaters, mm -hmm. and, you know, strapping up a defense, switching, guarding. I think I can guard one through four, one through three um, sometimes. So, you know, being able to switch, being able to guard my positions, you know, I definitely think that's, you know, my, my you know, success in the NBA can be 3 and D for sure. 
when what what are they kind of is that what they're telling you that they want your role to kind of be are they telling you hey look at what pj is doing because this is how we think you can carve out a spot yeah yeah they are for sure for sure and i ask pj a lot of questions off the court you know in practice and stuff like that so mm -hmm. he's very helpful so you know i definitely three and d that's definitely what they're preaching for me for sure I was looking at some of your stats and stuff earlier today, and I can't really find a consistent like height and weight for you. Did you <laughs> did you have like a, a like a later growth spurt or something? Oh man! Uh, so I did. The, I, I got measured in Philly without my shoes, and my hair was like you know cut low, low. <laughs> so it was like six four and three quarters, but they didn't round up, so they put six four. In my weight, I've always been around two fifteen, two twenty. So, in my opinion. This is my height and weight. I'm like six with shoes on. I'm like six, 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 five and a half, 215, 220. I'm with shoes on. But if my hair is grown out, it could be different. Like, because I had, like, my hair used to be a lot. So then my height went down a little bit. But I probably should give me a rematch <laughs> soon for sure. Because it's, it's, it's a lot of speculation out there for sure. That's good to know. Um, you, so you mentioned uh, the you know the 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 attachments that you have in Miami now. What are your thoughts on Miami? I know that it's pretty new for you. Have you gotten a chance to kind of explore? Do you have any favorite dinner spots yet? What do you think? Uh, yeah, I mean, I love the weather. Obviously, yeah. it's beautiful, sunny. You know, sunny during the winter time. So I've actually gotten you know a chance to explore kind of like I said, my daughter lives here, so I'm, I I I lived here kind of in the summertime basically. So. You know, I went to the beach. Beach is nice. I've been to a few restaurants. Uh, Tap 42 is pretty nice. Mm -hmm. uh, Carbon is pretty nice as well. So, mm -hmm. yeah, Miami, the city is beautiful. Obviously, when you got weather like this, there's a lot of stuff to do. Been on a few boats as well. So, it's, I mean, Miami has a lot of stuff to do. And, uh, you know, it's a great city to be in playing basketball as well. And it feels like, you know, your path to Miami, you've gone through a lot of different things. You've had to go again to Germany and Italy. And I, I feel it sounds like from this conversation, you've learned a lot about yourself and how to really work hard. And now you're in this organization when you have guys like Jimmy Butler, Udonis Haslam, Kyle Lowry, who kind of set the table from a culture standpoint, Pat Riley, Eric Spolstra, obviously, too. Um, what have you learned from those guys as far as just putting in the work and things like that? Uh, I think it's the attention to detail with every little thing. You know, um, definitely in the, in the locker room, you know, every halftime, you know, we're talking about something, arguing about something. It could be the little bit of thing, but, you know, it's, it could be the difference between winning and losing. So I understand mm -hmm. why, you know, we're doing that. So I think in addition to every little detail, you know, attention to every little thing, you know, defense-wise, offense-wise, you know, rebound and whatever. So, you know, they're all about winning at the end of the day. So I understand where they're coming from. What did you know about Pat Riley before you signed with the Heat? I heard it uh, kind of. I mean, he's just, you know, he's old school, you know, you know, toughness, you know, and just, you know, he's Pat Riley, you know. <laughs> yeah. I mean, not much to say, but I mean, I've heard, you know, just he's all about, you know, just culture and grit and grind and just, you know, toughness and stuff like that. Yeah, you just hear players talk about him all the time. He has like an aura, something like that. He walks into a room and you kind of notice him. Do you have any stories like that? Yeah, I mean, first time I ever saw him walk in, it was on like, it's been a shoot run. And I'm, you know, I'm looking at him like, well, that's Pat Riley. I mean, you know, it's a legendary, <laughs> one of the legendary coaches in NBA history. So, you know, definitely kind of an aura when he walks in the room, I feel like. And Eric Spolster has done so much to also, you know, create his, uh, I put his identity on the organization as well. I actually don't think people give him enough credit for that, but I also don't think that he's as big of a character as Pat Riley is. What can you tell people about Eric Spolster, who is maybe a little bit more of a player's coach than Pat Riley was back in the day? Yeah, I can, I can say that, you know, Eric's definitely more of a player's coach. Um, you know, he has some of the same ways I think Pat had probably, but, you know, he's definitely more mm -hmm. of a player's coach. You know, he, it's all about defense as well. So, you know, he's, like I said, attention to detail. He does that a lot. You know, you know, he's also a cool guy off the court as well, talking to him. Mm -hmm. You know, me and him talked about a couple of different things. Both are out. Well, my girlfriend, his wife, is kind of from the same area in Miami. So it's mm -hmm. pretty pretty cool to talk about. But, you know, he's a pretty cool guy. Last thing for me, um, as you guys, you know, play these final few games of the regular season schedule here, you're going to the playoffs, number one seed right now. What are you guys talking about in that locker room as far as goals, not just short term, right? Trying to get through the, you know, get through the rest of the schedule, but your goals for the postseason as well. Yeah, I mean, obviously it's championship or nothing. Mm -hmm. I felt like with the group we got, you know, we got a lot of pieces. We're a deep team as well. Um, you know, so all about championship, just you know, getting ready for the playoffs. We got 12 games left. And you know, just making sure we, you know, do those championship things, you know, just have our have our um have our 
methods or like have our tactics together, you know, make sure we're in championship mm -hmm. form and peaking at the right time as well. So, you know, we're just, you know, playoffs are right around the corner. So, you know, I think, you know, it's the stretch last stretch here, you know, we just keep pushing and let the rest take care of itself. And then, you know, it's time, it's, it's that time, you know, when playoffs start. Hey, what I really appreciate the time, man. Good luck uh, tomorrow night and uh, good luck on your sort of homecoming next week. Appreciate it. Yeah, yeah appreciate it, my guy. Yeah, good talking to you.